Hey everybody, my name is Shiza, and for the past couple of months, I've been really interested in AI, specifically computer vision, and its applications to the medical field. As a result, I've been building projects such as classifiers for hundred digits, clothing items, animals, vehicles, and brain tumors. But today I'll be talking about my recent project, which is segmenting brain tumors from MRI scans with 93% accuracy. Brain cancer and other nervous system malignancies are unfortunately the 10th leading cause of death worldwide. And on top of this, primary brain tumors are some of the most challenging types of cancers to treat, with an overall five-year survival rate of just 35%. Now in the process of extracting a tumor out of the brain, the neurosurgeon or radiologist first has to know where exactly the tumor is in the MRI scan. However, this process is time consuming, challenging, and error prone. Let's look at a few examples to see why this is actually a problem. So this is one of the more simpler examples, but this is the input image that one would have in the model. So this is an MRI scan, and what I'd like to do is call on Dev um, to tell me where he thinks the brain tumor is. In this image, I'll give you five seconds. I think the brain tumor is in the bottom right, this like green portion right here. Okay, yeah, so that's actually correct. You can see that this is the mass, so the segmented output, and your prediction is correct. So let me show you a harder example this time, and you have five seconds again. Um, I think it's this like little pink red thing on the bottom area. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm, I'm, like, I'm a professional doctor. 100% sure it's at the bottom. Okay, well, it's right here, actually. <laughs> so it wasn't that close. But you can see why the problem is time-consuming, challenging, and error-prone. However, a computer can do this task in just a few seconds and with a very high accuracy. By giving computers the ability to see and analyze images, they can perform a variety of tasks, such as semantic segmentation. Now, in the process of semantic segmentation, what happens is that every single pixel in the image is classified as a certain label. So for instance, if you can see the red box over here, that would be classified as the person label. And this one over there would be classified as the bench label. Now this happens to every single class, and then it's aggregated all together to come up with the segmented output, which again is called a mask. Now my project used semantic segmentation, as I mentioned, to segment brain tumors out of MRI scans. And it did this specifically with a UNET model, which is commonly used for semantic segmentation tasks. So it starts off with the input, which is the brain MRI scan, and then it goes to the model, specifically the encoder and the decoder, and then that's connected with the bottleneck, and then in the end you have the output, which again, segmented output. So first, as I mentioned, we go through the encoder, and the encoder's task is essentially to find the what and gain context to what's actually in the image. And so it does this by encoding the image into different feature representations at multiple different levels. What I mean by that is it first starts off with very high level features, so such as edges right there. And then it performs more and more computations to make the features more specific. So from edges it can go to shapes, from shapes it goes to objects, and so these computations are performed by the convolutional layer and the max bloom layer. The max cooling layer is used for downsampling. In other words, decreasing the size of the image proportionately. And this pattern is repeated a few times in the encoder. So now that we know the where of the image, now that we know the what of the image, we need to find the where. And so the where is going to be found with the decoder, which the entire purpose is for precise localization. And the computations it performs here are the convolutional layer and the upsampling layer. So the upsampling layer is basically the opposite of the downsampling layer, and it does it increases the image size. And then again, this pattern is repeated a few times. So specific to the image size, my model started off with a data set that was 96 by 96 pixels for all the images. And so once it goes to the decoder again, it, it decreases, and then the encoder it decreases, and then the decoder increases. So in the end, and in the beginning, it ends off and starts off with an image which is 96 by 96 pixels. So along with the encoder and the decoder, there are also skip connections. And skip connections are basically concatenating information from the past layers in the encoder to the current layers in the decoder. And this is allowing for more precise localization, but then also getting a more accurate output. 
And so after I got my data from Kaggle, I cleaned up the data, I pre-processed it, I modified it a bit so it would be more feasible to input into the model. And then I made the model from scratch in about 75 lines, to be exact. And then once it got in the model, I trained it, I tested it, and I validated it. And then I got the result of 93% accuracy. So because of this high accuracy, I've been in contact with some doctors, neuroscientists, neurosurgeons, and radiologists at different hospital settings to see if they'd be able to implement it. Because I think with this high accuracy, it would be beneficial. Now just to end off, I want to leave you all with a thought. So thinking about this project and extrapolating the potential it has, think about the impact it could make. That's why I wanted to reach out. But now, imagine thousands of projects like these for detection, for classification, for segmentation of diseases and illnesses being implemented. This will completely revolutionize the healthcare space. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed this presentation and learned something new along the way. At least for me, this entire process was so valuable, especially the part when I was storyboarding. And storyboarding is essentially optimizing the flow of my presentation. And so I did this storyboarding process and then preparing for the presentation in a couple of steps. So first of all, I worked on the flow, which is essentially the order of all the content that I wanted in my presentation. And so this was kind of vague, but at the same time, I would make it specific after. So it's just knowing more about what the structure would look like. And every single piece of content, whether it be an article, a video, a newsletter, all of them have some sort of similar form, which is a beginning, middle, and end, which made it really important for me to hook the audience's attention in the beginning and then keep that attention for the rest of the presentation. And so that's the sort of mindset I followed when trying to come up with the flow. After the flow, I'd included the relevant information that I needed for this flow. And if there was some extra research that I had to do for clarity on something, I would just include this information onto the storyboard along with the other information in tandem. After this, I made my slide deck, which is essentially the presentation slideshow. And I wanted to have visuals on every single slide. And when thinking about these visuals, the way I went about this is putting myself into the situation. If I was an audience member at my presentation, what would really help me visualize and conceptualize this process when I was talking about the model, when I was talking about the encoder and decoder, because I want to make a very complicated process and explain it very simply. So then after I made the slide deck, I got feedback on the slide deck and the storyboard from some of my friends, because in the Knowledge Society session that I was going to be presenting in, I had to present to people who were in a similar age group as me. And they had some relevant experience in AI, but weren't as, as of an expert as I am in the niche of biomedical imaging. And so because of this, getting feedback was really helpful because I got a sense from their perspective. I've been doing this for a couple of months, but them just looking at it from some basic knowledge, I got a sense of whether they understand it or not, if I have to add more sort of intuition to some parts of it. And I just found that overall really beneficial. And so after getting the feedback, I iterated it. And then I practiced the main points that I'd be talking about in my presentation. And then I was good to go. So I presented on a lovely Saturday. And after doing the presentation in front of a large amount of people, I would say it was an absolutely incredible experience. Like I've never really experienced something like this before. And it was just exhilarating the entire process, talking in front of people in some sort of casual tone, just being able to explain a complicated process in a simple manner. I just found that amazing. And it's really different from just doing online presentations and looking at this lens right there. And it was just a completely unbelievable experience. And by getting more and more feedback, I know that next time I iterate, the next time I get more reps in for presentations, I'm going to do better. And who knows, maybe I'll be speaking in some sort of conference or a stage anytime soon. So I really look forward to my growth in this aspect. So thank you for watching this video. And if you liked it, feel free to like the video, 
subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for more content that's coming. Also, if you'd like to reach out to me, please do not hesitate. I'll be linking down my socials in the description and you can contact me about all of my experience, projects, or if you want to jam out about AI, computer vision, the healthcare field or something along the lines of that. So I hope you enjoyed and thank you.